Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Our Reverend Prince Fleet Easton, I had requested that song. Dolly Parton wrote it, of course, about her mama making her a coat of many colors. And you're only poor if you think you are. And energetically, what we know is today we're going to look at inner child wisdom. And that within each and every one of us is this wonder child. And if we look at the archetypes, there is the, the innocent that comes in with bright eyes and everything is beautiful and wonderful until something happens. And then if we go from the innocent archetype of the child, not the wonder child, but the child, to the orphan, feeling that no one's there for us, that we feel absolutely abandoned. And what I know is that as we move through and go into the archetype of the caregiver, we begin caring for ourselves and doing our own work. There are 12 major archetypes. And if we realize that as we move through these 12 archetypes, we come to that place where we began and we know it for the first time. Why is that? Because we have enlightened our consciousness and that all of those experiences have been transmuted so that we may go out into the marketplace with healing, helping hands and serve others. Jesus, who became the Christ, said, let they who are great among you serve you. Think about it. Let they who are great among you serve you. So it is through this sacred service, energetically, and I love that, you know, we're all here today. And the Reverend Dr. Clayton Beaver, he is our in-house attorney and my friend of 35 years. I just love when he said that he found science of mind, like what, 35 years ago or whatever. And that, and he found Alcoholics Anonymous and he said, I was struck sober. Now, what I love about this is when we're struck sober and we begin to do our own work, we begin to develop a consciousness. And I love that you support and sponsor so many uh, people in the organization because the 12-step organization does the work on oneself so that we then can serve others. And having been raised in domestic violence myself, and I chose the spiritual path, my sister chose the alcoholic path. And it was, you know, as sad as it was, and I would go to court and she would you know, she would get in trouble and and she would have, you know, in those days, marijuana was, you know, it was a crime. She would have it on her. And I would go to court to have her released to my custody because we know that prison is just, it, it is a pretty horrendous thing. So I would speak in her behalf and I would say she's a product of her environment. She was raised in an alcoholic family and she has wounds, deep wounds that she is working on and healing and she has these slips and every judge that i ever appeared before always said you are her sister why aren't you that way and my response because i knew i had a choice and when we recognize that we have a choice that we can choose a higher path and I chose the spiritual path and did a lot of work on myself and was in therapy to absolutely release those deep insecurities and not feeling good enough, not feeling deserving enough. And anyone raised in domestic violence, we all have our things that we have had the opportunity to work on so that we can come out on the other side of it and then serve others out of it. Now, you know, it's what's amazing about this inner child wisdom is that that wonder child is resilient. I have a photograph of myself at four years old with bright eyes and I have, you know, this like white hair, literally. And I look at her and she's got this look on her face. You can do anything. And why is that? Because my mother, who gave birth to me on her 19th birthday, when I was downhearted or I had things go on, she would say, you can do anything. 
you can do anything. When Emily Dickinson said, I dwell in possibility, what are those possibilities? They come up for us. They show themselves. And we have to put the works with the faith and realize that we have created these experiences to grow, to evolve, to unfold, to expand. And when we come out on the other side of that, there is a wholeness that we at times never knew was possible. There is a completeness of spirit. And one of the things that my mother would do, uh, my father always went on his alcoholic binges at Christmas time. So she looked around, she was 29 years old. I was like, you know, 10 years old or 11. My little sister was four years younger than me. She looked around at our property in the San Fernando Valley. That's when it was all orange groves and walnut groves. And we had six walnut trees on the property. She looked around, she says, we have six trees, we have walnuts that are ready to harvest. And she hired immigrant workers with great big long poles and hooks on them so that they would go around to each tree and they would shake the trees. And these uh, workers were called shakers. And they would shake the trees and all the walnuts came down. And my mother had all these gunny sacks and my sister and I would help her. We would fill the gunny sacks with her. Now I had you know, shared this on Facebook, but I didn't go into the intimate detail of how humiliated I felt when I went to school because the skin of a walnut is very, very dark, and my hands were so stained, and I couldn't get it off. Let me tell you, I used everything, including bleach. I could not, you know, here I am, 10, 11 years old, could not get the stain off my hands. So I'm sitting in class, and we had a substitute teacher because our teacher uh, was off, and she was ill. And this substitute teacher had, you know, she had a kind of great pointy nose and a little wart on her nose, and she had like this steel gray hair. And we used to, you know, behind her back, call her the Wicked Witch of the West. And she, you know, fulfilled that expectation perfectly. So she said to me, look at those dirty hands. And she said it in front of the whole class. You get to the lavatory and you wash your hands. And I said, it won't come off. And she said, yes, it will. Get to the lavatory. You wash those dirty hands. So I went and I, you know, nothing happened came back then she grabbed me you know uh with you know great kind of fingernails on uh my arm and marched me back to the lavatory and washed and washed and what it would not come out it was dyed you have to wear out and you can imagine my humiliation in my fifth grade class and i just you know was just tearful and she mustered up a very weak apology. And I went home and told my mother what had happened. And my mother marched into that school and she said, you will not treat my daughter in this way. And then she went to the principal and she was like this, I was born on her birthday and this Leo energy that came up about, you know, my little cub. And what I knew is that I was affirmed by my mother. No matter what my father did, I was affirmed. My existence was affirmed by my mother, who took a stand for me in my life. And when my mother and sister were on their way to Placerville, and they were going to start a new life, uh, they broke down in the Caliente Mountains above Nevada, they were there for eight days and eight nights without food or water. My sister took her own life on the third day because she said to my mother, we're never going to get out of this alive. They had a white car and they had been broken into six months prior. And my sister had a broken femur. Uh, he broke her femur. And my mother had a broken pelvis in three places when she went to go to the phone. The intruder uh, beat them and broke their bones. So they were actually in recovery. I mean, I'm writing a book called The Saint, The Witness, and The Angel, uh, a young man who rescued my mother after being there with my sister's body for five days. And they went up 60 miles up the Caliente Mountains because they didn't want to be caught by the rangers. And when they came upon my mother, and my mother said that night before that an angel appeared to her 
And she said, I just, I was weeping. And I said, you won't take your living and you won't take your dead. What shall I do? And the angel said, fear not. You will be rescued tomorrow. And it will not be by the rangers. And as quickly as the angel came, she said it disappeared. And the next morning when she heard gunshots, she yelled, help, help. And they came to her. And the young man, they were in their 20s. The young man said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I am a religious man. And what I know is I must be the saint. You are the witness and your daughter is the angel who led us to you to rescue you. And they wrapped her up in swaddling clothes and a blanket. And they gave her drops of water. Drops of water and took her to Dixie Hospital in St. George, Utah. And when I received a call from a social worker at St. George, she said, your mother and sister were in an accident. Your sister died, but your mother is safely in the hospital. She had third degree burns. It was Labor Day weekend. So it was like 120 during the day and it was like 30 at night, it was freezing. And they put SOS on top of the, the car because planes went by every single day. SOS. And I said, if you'd been arsons, the fire would still be burning. You were two women in distress. The fire went out. They started a fire. It went out. You know, life and karma is so amazing. And to have these boys in their 20s rescue my mother. And then I had her come live with me. And Mark Victor Hansen wrote me and he wanted me to put a, a story and a recipe in his cookbook for the cookbook soul. And so my mother would make the most amazing divinity with the walnuts. And whenever things were in an upheaval, she would say, let's make divinity. Well, she made amazing divinity. And so I thought I'll put my mother's divinity recipe in the book. And this amazing story, this was right on the heels of my sister's suicide. And she just, you know, it perked her up and she just, you know, she felt like this sense of inspiration. And I submitted it and the editor wrote back a couple of things to change. And I changed them and sent it back immediately because she was on a timeline. And when the book came out, it uh, did not include my very raw vignette. I mean, it, you know, I'm, I did share what had happened and then I had the recipe and how, you know, out of evil, Joseph said, out of evil cometh good. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And so, you know, I was, of course, very disappointed in this. And what is so interesting is that Louise Hay wrote a book called Gratitude. It's called Louise Hay and Friends. It's called Gratitude. And she asked me to to put a story of what I was most grateful for. And lo and behold, as I went within, what was I most grateful for? I was most grateful for my mother looking around, a 29-year-old woman looking around and saying, what are my options? I've got six walnut trees. I'm gonna fill gunny sacks. And she always made $500 at least. And she spent the whole thing on Christmas for my sister and I. And she looked around, she saw what she had, and she utilized it. So that was the most valuable lesson for me because in my life, at my lowest moments, I look around and say, what are my choices here? And I go with the highest choice that lifts me beyond the circumstance that I find myself in into the solution level. And I want you to know that in our way of life, we do not judge anyone who takes their own life. However they choose to leave the planet, we bless them with compassion and our love. And when I had my sister's ashes on my altar and I was in a twilight zone, my sister came to me and she said, oh, Sharon, Sharon, I'm just so sorry for everything I did when I was on the planet. I'm so sorry. And I said, she said, please forgive me. And I said, of course I forgive you. And she said, I'm in my light body now. And I understand. 
I'm in my light body now, and I understand. And with as quickly as she came, she disappeared. And I had such a feeling of gratitude and such a feeling of knowing that in my father's house are many, many mansions, that I've had amazing experiences in the 40, almost 46 years of my ministry and 20 of it here at Interface Spiritual Center worldwide in Palm Springs. And when I submitted the story to Louise Hay, and what I was most grateful for, and how my mother, you know, used to make divinity, and how wonderful that was for us, that out of evil cometh good. That yes, my husband's left us, we're here kind of holding the, the empty bag, <laughs> and what do I have? I have six walnut trees. Walnut trees are very sacred to me, you can imagine. And isn't it interesting that if you un, uh, open the walnut, it looks like a brain. And so all the, the major naturopaths and doctors say, eat walnuts if you want to increase your brain power. And I think I was raised, I was raised on walnuts. How wonderful that it has served me well in the almost 77 years I've been on the planet. So I shared the story with Louise Hay. She wrote me back a personal note. And she said, of all the stories that have been submitted by all of you luminaries, this one touched me the most. That my mother's story touched her the most. That my experience of a little girl with stained hands touched her the most. So what we know is that when one door closes, another one opens. And I want you to know the editor of that uh, chicken soup for the cookbook soul moved to Palm Springs. And every time I saw her, my heart wrenched. And I was always nice to her. But the piercing of how she excluded my mother and I and I feel that I'm very enlightened. However, it brought it up every time I saw her. And then she was on Facebook and she put a picture of her mother, her dearly departed mother. And I said, oh, our mothers are probably together eating my mother's divinity. And I told her the whole story and how she excluded my mother's story, my story and my mother's divinity recipe. She wrote back and she had no memory of it whatsoever. And isn't this a lesson that we carry things? In fact, I thought that I had healed it, but the minute I saw her, it brought it all up again. And my inner wonder child that's so resilient and so out there and feeling the joy, which is the most, what? Joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God, isn't it? And so on this Facebook post, I was able to share with her that every time I saw her, my I felt like that, my heart, the piercing that was originally there, and that I would have to work through it to um, be cordial and to, you know, acknowledge her because she's a lovely person. And I said, and you don't know how freeing this is for me to share this with you. And she said, well, I had a three-month timeline and you know maybe you didn't get it. I said no I did everything you asked I said the story was pretty raw it was about you know my sister taking her own life and my they were stranded and and how we were raised in domestic violence and my stained hands I put all of that in the story as I did with Louise Hay I said maybe it was just too raw for you because yeah, a lot of the as I read it you know, it was a lot of, you know, happiness things. Well, I felt that mine was happiness. It had a good ending, right? And even though the journey was very sorrowful and painful, I came out on the other end and then took care of my mother for nine years. So our inner child, the wonder child, the inner child wisdom is to go through it all and to here we are where we began and to know it for the first time. It's all new. This day has never been lived in, has it? This moment is new. 
and that we open to our inner child wisdom, knowing that as we draw the larger circle energetically, that we embody every experience. There's a book called Celebrate the Temporary, and it's so beautiful. And it said, just love everyone, even those who appeared not to love you. Maybe they wanted to, and they didn't know how. Love them anyway. Love them anyway. Draw the larger circle and just include everything that comes up. And that no matter how long we've been here on the planet, we're here to grow and to unfold. We all have feet of clay, don't we? And so our, our, our assignment is really to heal ourselves, to reach out to others, to realize our oneness, and to acknowledge that this Earth Mother is such a blessing for each and every one of us. And for those of you who did not have a relationship with your mother, or maybe never knew your mother, or there were per very hurtful and painful things, just draw the larger circle, include those, and open the heart of compassion and forgiveness. And as we open our heart to compassion and forgiveness, we can celebrate the temporary. We can celebrate this moment and the next moment and the next moment. So for all of you, for all of you on this Mother's Day and all of you who have mothers, I have some wonderful male mothers that are, I know, viewing that are just amazing and fabulous cooks. In fact, my husband was the chef in our household. Uh, I grew up with my mother opening cans, you know, and so I had to learn how to do that. So he gave me a little plaque and it said, I kiss better than I cook. <laughs> and he was the chef. So all of our beautiful, dearly departed loved ones, and we're going to have a high tea today. And each one of us, we brought a photograph of our mother and we're going to share, and we will go live at the table. This high tea is an amazing uh, high tea. The uh, London scones and all of the, the quiche Provence and the amazing, wonderful delicacies. Uh, when I do a high tea, you know, I order it uh, through those that specialize in high teas. And there's like the French Connection who does a beautiful job of making quiches. I actually made my own quiche today because uh, sometimes we just like to do that and to feel the energy of it. And But everything else I ordered, and as we sit at the table together and we experience the energy of high tea, and all of us live alone, so it's so wonderful to sit down together and feel the magic and the energy of friendship and family. This is why I love our way of life. I just absolutely love it. And for those of you who are struck sober and open the space to allow God to do what God does best, we go into higher consciousness, don't we? I love, love, love that concept. So today, I know that we're all on the path and we're all going somewhere. Where is it? Higher yet. Where is it? Higher yet. Where is it? Higher yet because we're in a high place and we will not come down. None of these outer things move us. We are in a high place and we will not come down. I say namaste. The divinity within me salutes the divinity within you and the divinity within you salutes the divinity within me. And if I am in that place in me and you are in that place in you, there is only one of us, right? Namaste. Shalom. The peace that passes all understanding. And God bless us, everyone. I'm just so happy to be here on this Mother's Day. Uh, Mother's Day was always very sad for me because my uh, daughter's son-in-law and my grandson moved out of state many years ago. And two years ago, my daughter said, what do you want for your 75th birthday? 
And I said, I want you to come to Palm Springs for Mother's Day. So for my, I hadn't seen them for six years on a Mother's Day. Two years ago, they came for my 75th birthday, which was in July. Mother's Day was in May. I said, that's all I want. I would look out every Mother's Day and all the families and all the beautiful energy. And uh, I would be tearful. And uh, then I started saying, what sacred service can I perform uh, with my friends who are actually my family as well? And so we're going to honor our mothers today at our high tea table. And it will be wonderful, won't it? Absolutely wonderful. So thank you. I love you. And take it away, our dear fleet. Thank you, fleet. Thank you.